Hello, you're listening to New England Climate Conversations, the podcast all about the impacts of climate change and how we can make a difference. I'm your host, Owen, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Dean, Luna, and Corbin. On this episode, we'll be talking about walkability and public transportation in Down East Maine, including an interview with Dale Basher, the housing director at Down East Community Partners. But first, let's get into the weekly Climate Bites. For those tuning in for the first time, Climate Bites is our rapid-fire segment about recent major climate events. I'll turn it over to Luna to start. This week on Climate Bites. September 2023 was the hottest September globally, with reference to data spanning back to 1940. The European data is particularly grim, an anomaly of 2.51 degrees Celsius hotter than the 1991 to 2020 average. Some parts of the world saw much wetter conditions with extreme rainfall events such as Hurricane Lee battering parts of the U.S. Other parts of the world, like Oceania, saw record-breaking dry weather conditions. Antarctic sea ice remained at low levels this year, approximately 9% below the 1991 to 2020 average. This is Luna for New England Climate Conversations Climate Bites. Back to you, Dean. All right, and almost as a continuation of last last week's climate bite, uh, on November 15th and 16th in Malaysia is going to be the Youth for Capacity event. So it's sponsored by a variety, uh, by the UN and some related organizations, uh, such as the UN Global Compact, the COP28 Presidency, and the UN Development Program. This, uh, This event, the Youth for Capacity, is basically inviting youth participants to attend the Asia-Pacific Regional Climate Week in Yohor Baru in person to enhance their contributions to the climate action landscape through capacity building sessions on a just energy transition and green entre- entrepreneurship per the UN website. So uh, that, as I mentioned, that'll be happening November 15th and 16th, and we'll see what that brings forward. Back to you, Corbin. Northern India has had severe flooding recently due to the monsoon season this June. A monsoon surge has led to the largest recorded rainfall in northern India. Over the two-week period of landslides and flooding, roughly 100 100 residents were confirmed dead and thousands are retreating to safety camps. Roads were flooded, highways destroyed, and rivers overfilled in the largest monsoon surge seen this year. Back to you, Dean. Thanks, Corbin. So the, a continuation of the Hawaii wildfire situation from uh, a little while back, which saw 99 dead and an entire village destroyed in record time, there are currently new fires burning on, Hawa- on Oahu Island in the Oahu Central Mountain Rainforest. The rainforest, which is irreplaceable, contains 22 endangered species in the lands the fire has destroyed so far, which constitutes a 2.5 square mile area. That's six and a half square kilometers. So the fire was spotted on October, on October 30th, and although it was 90% contained as of, as of uh, November 10th, it is of particular cause for concern that these fires started on the windward and the wetter side of Oahu. So we'll have, to, we'll have to stay waiting for further developments on that. And now I'm going to pass, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague Luna for her article on walkability in Downey's Maine. If you've ever stepped out of your home and pondered, why can't I seem to get where I need to go without a car? Then you might be in need of transportation solutions rather than putting a down payment on a new car. But when the act of simply walking from point A to point B risks life and limb, the dilemma presents an obstacle to vehicle independence. Walkability centers the person rather than the vehicle, and we know that vehicle dependence detrimentally impacts community character. A person should be able to comfortably and joyfully walk in order to participate within the wider community. At the end of 2022, the numbers of pedestrian deaths continue to rise after a high in 2021. 20 pedestrians and two bicyclists have been killed on Maine roads this year, according to the Maine Department of Public Safety. A ballooning tourist industry and crumbling infrastructure in Maine means that it is unseasonably and unjustly difficult to get to a destination without intimately experiencing isolation, disease, and a sense of not belonging. How does the region, Maine specifically, meet the growing demand for walkable neighborhoods? WalkScore, a Redfin data aggregating website focused on transit-oriented accessibility, lists the nine largest city in Maine ranking as somewhat walkable, as best to almost completely car-dependent. First off, a look at traditional town planning. A charming, picturesque New England town is what draws in visitors and prospective residents alike. The classic form of a central hub of shops, green spaces, and community gathering spaces is at the heart of traditional town planning. 
In New England, that is the defining feature of peaceful and vibrant small communities that keep tourists coming year after year, and some to stay around permanently. However, these communities as a whole face a stasis of development. To put it bluntly, they can't keep up with present needs in light of a post-pandemic economy, and mounting pressures of population decline in the state. The challenge of a main communities is resisting the pitfalls of mass commercial development, that of which car-dependent infrastructure is its lifeblood. To that end, traditional community planning is central to a practically applied type of climate change solution. The benefits of walkable neighborhoods are manifold, and centering people is central to climate impact mitigation, even reversal. Let's take a look at climate change. We find that this type of planning's impact on climate issues is an intertwining of different environmental benefits, one impacting the other. A dynamic web of positive outcomes for the area, if not the planet. Transportation accounts for 28% of greenhouse gas emissions. The Congress for the New Urbanism points to walkable neighborhoods as contributing to a reduction of four tons of emissions annually compared to vehicle-dependent suburbs. Furthermore, car dependence means more carbon-based emissions relating to cooling needs. All that car-centered infrastructure means increasing contributions to the heat island effect of its infrastructure implied with pedestrian and mass transit-oriented development means that communities are compact and diversely occupied. In other words, we can get most of the day's tasks done without needing to commute, thus alleviating the need for constant car usage and accompanying damaging effects. It is unreasonable, however, to simply call for people to drive less when life is spread so thinly over miles of concrete and pavement. Thus, the need for walkable neighborhoods is obvious, but how can we foresee that playing out in the unique circumstance that many mean cities face? The living is highly cyclical, and tourism and seasonal industries like maritime food production have produced small, quaint towns punctuated with sprawling and ill-planned retrofitting, which prioritize getting people and goods to seasonal destinations. Where does that leave full-time residents? The complaints are not unknown to the casual observer. It is incredibly difficult to get even to the other side of the city. It is unsafe to walk. Furthermore, it is untenable to rely on mass transit, assuming it's even available. The much-beloved Island Explorer serving portions of Down East Maine runs part of the year and deals with overcrowding and service unavailability to working residents who are in need of regular, reliable, and affordable transportation. Coupled with quiet winter months, residents can feel a sense of loneliness and depression, separated from the wider community. The Maine Department of Transportation's Village Partnerships Initiative was established to revitalize community centers of living, such as downtowns or village greens. The initiative offers two different scales of funding and other types of aid primarily to enhance pedestrian and mass transit safety and infrastructure. Bangor, Maine is one such town considering a bid with the DOT's initiative that would improve sewage infrastructure and traffic calming measures. Bangor has been looking to enhance the city's safety, a multi-million dollar endeavor. The VPI could contribute to a large portion of some of the needed updates. In Biddeford, Maine, the city's rapidly desirable proximity to Portland has contributed to new plans to revitalize the area, which includes a new neighborhood and residential mixed-use development in the style of traditional European central town planning. This concludes an initial investigation into vehicle independence in Maine's communities. On future looks, we'll take a closer eye at public transit in the state. Until next time, this is New England Climate Conversations. All right. Hello, Dale. Hello, Owen. How, how are you today? Doing pretty well. How about yourself? Doing well, thanks. All right. Let's just start with a basic introduction. Uh, you know, where are you from? Which org do you represent? And who are you? Uh, my name is Dale Basher, and I'm serving as the uh, housing director for Down East Community Partners. All right. How did you get your start in this business? In 2010, uh, the housing crash um, changed my life rather rapidly. I was working for myself um, in the construction world, and I needed a job. So I took a job. It was My plan was to only work for the winter for, at the time, uh, Washington Hancock Community. WHC. It's been it's been six years, so I couldn't remember the name of the place. Um, so uh, in two thousand eight, mm -hmm. I, I was working for myself, and uh, the housing market took a turn for the worst. And I needed a I needed a job, so I I came on to uh, WHCA, which is Washington Hancock Community Agency, and later became uh, Down East Community Partners uh, about six years ago. And, um, and my plan was to only work here for three months, and then spin back out on my own. And fourteen years later, I'm still here. All right. Uh, have you noticed any positive or negative trends in Maine housing stock over the years? Yes, I, I think with the uh, um, with the creation of Airbnbs um, and and seasonal rentals, uh, we saw we've seen a, a loss in a lot of rental stock, which has uh, put a crunch on the housing market. And then 
of course that that was that was brought to the next level with the pandemic. A lot of people with the um, during the pandemic decided to migrate to Maine because it's a much safer place to live, and that really changed the face of our housing stock and what was available for the people who, who live in Maine. Um, and then it also creates a problem for workforce development because bringing in new people to uh, work here in Maine, um, they have no place to live. So it makes it a real challenge to bring in a new workforce and it makes it a new challenge to find affordable housing because uh, when the supply goes down, the, the demand goes up and the price goes up. So it's been a real challenge. How do you see Maine housing stock and affordability looking like in a decade or so? That's a good question. Uh, we the, the issue that I see is uh, being able to build affordable housing. Um, mm -hmm. being, being able to build housing is is rather, I hate to say simple, it's not simple, but uh, to be able to build housing that people can afford is what my, my biggest fear is. And because <clears throat> we can build these nice new shiny buildings, but it costs, cost, cost, the cost per square foot right now to build is, is enormous. And then adding on the new building codes, which is, they're fantastic. I love them, but it does add um, an, an added cost to each one of these builds. So how do we do that and then keep the rents affordable? And uh, the only way I see that happening is is through subsidies. And mm -hmm. is that sustainable? That That's a very good question. I don't know the answer to these questions. Um, no. uh, I just know that it's a real challenge. Uh, how would you recommend the average Mainer confront housing accessibility? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, and the only way I've been able to figure out how to do it is tiny footprint, um, going with a small house, uh, either uh, the modular type homes um, or, or or being creative out of the box and then talking to contractors about container homes or, or, or turning these Amish type sheds into uh, year round dwellings. Uh, it can be done. Uh, I've seen it here in Maine and it can be done very effectively. Um, and that could reduce our uh, burden for people starting out. So the younger generation that, that doesn't require a large footprint until they move into a family uh, need need a larger footprint for to raise a family. Uh, it would be it'd be a great way to um, um, start people's adult lives. And it, and and on the flip side of that, it might be a great way uh, towards the end of the life cycle as well because. As we become older, we don't have those families anymore, and uh, and I'm at the point in my life where I'm looking at uh, a much smaller footprint because I don't need that much space. So I, I feel that, that those are the two things that we should be talking about and encouraging uh, because uh, we're seeing a lot of a lot of elderly people that are prisoners in these large homes because they have no place to go. Hmm. All right, moving on to walkability. Uh, what are some contributing factors to the walkability issue in your view? Uh, I'll, I'll just take my own community here in Ellsworth. Um, there's like two crosswalks um, <laughs> in the entire city. <laughs> it's it's very difficult to walk around the city of Ellsworth other than Main Street. Main Street walkability is fantastic, but if you get up on, say, High Street in Ellsworth, there's 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 like two crosswalks for a two mile stretch and, yep. and that, that's unsatisfactory. And, and, it, and it's just not, it, it doesn't even, it's not safe to walk in that type of environment. Um, it's, it, it creates a, a, a real safety concern in my mind because we see people walking more and more and we see people wanting to use bicycles and there, there are no bike paths. There's no, mm -hmm. And then uh, putting bicycles uh, or electric bikes or e-bikes on the sidewalk is a is not a great idea. So how do yeah. we how do we change that? I think um, city like Ellsworth has exceeded its capacity for uh, two way streets and start looking at uh, one way street designs like they did in Boston and some of the other largest cities when they exceeded their capacity for their 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 two way streets, and that would mm -hmm. open up um, an avenue for um, uh, more. Um, walking paths and, and bicycle lanes if we started think, rethinking about uh, how our streets work in cities like Ellsworth, because when the main arteries are clogged with traffic and the side roads have no traffic at all, uh, that, that tells you everything you need to know. Yep. All right. You touched on this uh, a bit with the one-way streets, but what are some realistic solutions to the current walkability problem in down East Maine? Uh, I would really like to see us connect these trails together uh, through uh, networking, uh, grants, and and creativity. 
Um, I don't see there's any. I don't see any reason why we couldn't uh, take a bike from Ellsworth to Bar Harbor. I think that would increase uh, commerce for Ellsworth. Uh, I think it would. Uh, it would. It would lessen the uh, burden of traffic on MDI, and that's just an example. I mean, Maine has a, yep. a host of areas that that could accommodate uh, something of this nature, but somebody needs to be first. Yep. Uh, is DCP working to help confront some of these issues? Absolutely. Um, Owen, uh, you're you're part of the Climate Corps, and we've had numerous conversations uh, in regards to this. And I, I and I'm I'm hoping that these conversations that we're having uh, are not uh, falling on um, uh, by the wayside. And we 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 have ideas on how to uh, how to make this better. Um, and I think people are listening. Uh, it's just a matter of putting these ideas on paper and and being able to uh, relay them to our, our community leaders and, and in a fashion that they understand and realize that change is, is, is what really needs to happen. All right. Do you have anything else you'd like to say about the issue, walkability or um, uh, housing stock, anything we've talked about? Yeah, the housing stock, I, I really think that in the urban areas uh, that um, – Everybody talks about the tiny houses, and I love them. But in urban areas, it's best to put the tiny houses on top of one another, and they're called apartments. I just think that would be a much better uh, solution for the urban areas. But when we start getting in areas like Washington County, um, and and this one of the poorest areas in the country, yeah. um, and uh, I just think that a tiny house village uh, down in that area would be ideal solution for uh, some of the challenge we're, challenges we're seeing with um, with new people and elderly people that cannot um, figure out a way to afford their, their their living standard. We're seeing the house, the housing stock um, is just got, it, it's gotten to the point where people can't afford to maintain their home because of the cost of contractors or the limit or the, the fact there's, a, there's not many contractors that are uh, that are actually doing the work. So, um, so that has created a, a big downturn in, in the quality of our housing stock. So anybody who wants to buy a home is buying a home that is, uh, has a cost of cure. Um, and that cost of cure is not inexpensive these days. Um, the, the, the price of roofing right now is uh, anywhere from 650 to 750 a square. And um, that means that every 10 by 10 section of the roof uh, is, is that's what it costs. And, and, in the average home is, um, I'll give you an idea, a mobile home is around 12 to 12 square, 12 to 14 square. So uh, that's, um, and that's a very small, that's a very small roof. You start getting into these older colonial homes and it's not uncommon to see houses up in the twenty thirty thousand dollars range. Mm. Um, and the average person just cannot afford that to even maintain a roof. And without a roof, you don't really have a house. Yeah. So uh, we're seeing th that play into effect uh, all over Eastern Maine. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Been good talking to you. Hope you have a good rest of the day. That's all for this week's episode. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on your favorite social media platform and share it with your friends. Also, if there are any topics you would like us to cover in the future, feel free to reach out via social media or leave a comment on our YouTube channel. See you next week when we'll be covering the effects of climate change on fisheries and con conservations, including a closer look at lobsters and right whales, as well as a bigger picture look at the effects on the ocean at large.